Since the dawn of capitalism, the capitalist class has had to keep an eye on the working class in order to keep them in check. This surveillance has been around for a long time, but the story of the modern surveillance state begins about a century ago. Today, the surveillance apparatus of the U.S. capitalist imperialist system is so large, so powerful, it can be difficult to even comprehend. Today in the 21st century, over 3,000 private companies work in intelligence in over 10,000 locations across the United States. Over 850,000 people hold top secret security clearances. And 33 buildings in just the Washington, D.C. area alone have been built since 2001, all focused on intelligence. Over 50,000 intelligence reports are published every year, and the U.S. government itself maintains 17 separate intelligence agencies. This is just the beginning of the modern surveillance state. These numbers come from an investigative report published in 2010. In the words of the authors, Every day across the United States, 854,000 civil servants, military personnel, and private contractors with top secret security clearances are scanned into offices protected by electromagnetic locks, retinal cameras, and fortified walls that eavesdropping equipment cannot penetrate. Since this report was published over a decade ago, before Edward Snowden leaked documents in 2013 exposing the nefarious plans of the U.S. surveillance state apparatus, I can only imagine how much the surveillance state has grown since then. But where did all this begin? Let's talk about it. Welcome to the Peace Report, an anti-imperialist media outlet. Be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell to be notified for updates. This channel is supported by people on Patreon who are kind enough to support the channel financially by sending a few bucks per month. Thanks for stopping by and I hope you enjoy the video. The beginning of the modern surveillance state can be traced back to just over a century ago. And many books have been written on this topic, so there's too much to cover in just this video. But we hope to lay the foundation of the origins, history, and development of this surveillance state. There are two main methods to pay close attention to when examining this history. First, there have been three main stages of development concerning the history of the modern surveillance state. Each stage is structured into a regime. The first manual information regime was set up through colonial intervention during the U.S.-Philippines War of 1899-1902. to The second computerized information regime was set up in the Imperialist War in Vietnam of 1965-1975. to The third robotic information war was set up during the U.S. wars in Iraq and Afghanistan during the first part of the 21st century. The second method to pay attention to is that with each stage comes a three-part process. First, technologies advance in the imperialist core. Second, technologies are tested on oppressed people in the periphery. And third, the technologies and methods are incorporated into the surveillance apparatus to be used on everyone, including the oppressed in the periphery and all classes in the imperialist core, which includes the ruling classes in the U.S. and abroad. Intelligence is a weapon. The first information regime in the U.S.-Philippines War, or otherwise known as the American-Philippines War, solidified the first modern state surveillance apparatus. The first part, advancement of technology, began during the 1870s and the 1880s, what can be referred to as the information revolution. Historian Alfred McCoy provides deep insight into this wave of new technological innovations in information. In one extraordinary decade, from the 1870s to the 1880s, that information revolution arose from a synergy of innovations in the management of textual, statistical, and visual data, creating, for the first time, the technical capacity for surveillance of the many rather than the few, a defining attribute of the modern state. New technologies such as the commercial typewriter, the quadruplex telegraph, the telephone, the punch guard, photo engraving, the Dewey Decimal System, fingerprint classification, biometric identification systems, and others were innovated. These innovations allowed for 
filing, tabulating, organizing, automating, recording, and retrieving huge amounts of information. And in 1885, the first military intelligence agency was set up, the Military Information Division. These technologies and the new military intelligence agency were brought to the Philippines a decade later. The conquest of the Philippines unleashed the potential of these new technologies to form the country's first information regime. As the army battled an extraordinary array of insurgents, national army, urban underground, militant unions, messianic peasants, and Muslim separatists. In the process, the colonial government formed three new services seminal for the creation of counterintelligence capacity, a division of military information, which developed internal security methods later applied to the United States, the Philippines Constabulary that pacified the new colony's insurgency through pervasive surveillance, and the highly efficient Manila Metropolitan Police. Throughout all of this, a U.S. Army officer who developed new counterintelligence doctrines and pushed for further advances in surveillance became known as the father of military intelligence. His name, Ralph Van Diemen. Going on to the third part of this process was bringing the new agencies, doctrines, and technologies back to the U.S. to incorporate into the state apparatus. Later, World War I kicked off, and the working class of the U.S. began to protest the war. This was a perfect time to begin a battle of intelligence at home. Dissidents, agitators, resistors, anarchists, and communists were all targeted with these new state structures. And who better to lead the way than Ralph Van Diemen? Van Diemen fused federal agencies, civilian agencies, and military branches that would install common intelligence operations for the next half century. This included J. Edgar Hoover and the FBI, private security forces like the Pinkertons, and even so-called patriotic organizations like the Protective League and the American Legion all to build an extensive network of informants, agents, and infiltrators to bring down anyone they choose to target, but mainly political targets. This three-part process, now set in the stone, began with advances in technology, experimented on oppressed people in the third world, then incorporated into the state apparatus to be used on anyone and everyone. It led to the Delimitations Agreement of 1940, which was produced in a secret meeting, and it divided the world into sections, where the military would collect intelligence on the world, while the FBI would collect information at home. Van Diemen and J. Edgar Hoover and the current chief of staff attended the meeting. Later on, the Five Eyes Alliance, which was established during World War II, and is a multilateral UK-USA agreement, but includes Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, hence Five Eyes, it later became Nine Eyes and again Fourteen Eyes, which included more European nations. Its essential function was to have each nation spy on each other's citizens in order to bypass any domestic restrictions. Eventually, the National Security Act of 1947 was passed, which created the CIA along with many other intelligence agencies and branches. This all led to the Red Scare of the 1950s, where intelligence was used as a weapon to hunt down anyone associated with communism, which was growing worldwide due to the Soviet Union's success in the war. Again, Van Diemen remained a major part of all of this. Now a general in the military, he worked with the FBI and other agencies to participate in the Committee on Un-American Activities, essentially a communist hunting committee because the ruling class was trembling at the rise of communism within U.S. soil. This was the first manual information regime. The second computerized information regime can be traced back to the Vietnam War. After World War II, again, new technologies were advanced. Then, Vietnam became the target to begin the experiments. The U.S. military used IBM computers to produce dot matrix maps of the Vietnamese countryside. They compiled tabulations of 12,000 villages and filed 3 million documents on enemies which were captured on giant reels of barcoded film. The CIA led the Phoenix program, which was designed to infiltrate, capture, interrogate, torture, and assassinate the Viet Cong, 
but ended up killing mostly civilians. The CIA also developed the Hamlet Evaluation Survey. After Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara put out a call to design something to interpret the status of control in the countryside, IBM computers were used to create these maps, but ultimately resulted in underestimating the popular support of the Viet Cong from the masses. The experiments in the U.S. imperialist war in Vietnam led to bringing it all back and incorporating it into the U.S. state apparatus and news on the growing dissidents and communists. Anti-war activists broke into an FBI office and leaked documents that exposed the counterintelligence program, known more commonly as COINTELPRO. This targeted every leftist organization in the country, including some of the big names like Black Panther Party, Revolutionary Action Movement, the Republic of New Africa, Students for a Democratic Society, and many more. The heavy crackdown on leftist organizations led to the Church Committee investigations, which was a Senate Select Committee which conducted a series of investigations throughout 1975 into the intelligence abuses from the CIA, FBI, IRS, NSA, and other agencies. The year was called the Year of Intelligence. The FBI eventually admitted to conducting over 2,200 separate COINTEL actions from 1956 to 1971. In addition, other illegal and heinous programs were revealed, such as Operation MK Ultra, which involved the drugging and torturing of unwitting U.S. citizens as part of a human experimentation on mind control. Later, investigative journalist Seymour Hersh exposed even more programs, such as Operation Chaos, an illegal surveillance on U.S. citizens, Operations Shamrock and Minaret, two sister organizations aimed at intercepting electronic communications across the country. But one of the more shocking programs revealed was a surveillance program codenamed Echelon. It was a complete secret for decades. First uncovered by a British investigative journalist, Duncan Campbell, in 1988, the revealing of such an expansive spying program caused an international scare. It wasn't just a domestic surveillance program, it was a global one. The intelligence community justified its existence as being used against the Soviet Union and communism, but after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the program actually expanded. It was even used to spy on corporations to give U.S. industry an advantage over its competitors in order to win large contracts. Such was the case in 1994 when Brazil put out a contract bid to develop their own surveillance system to cover the entire Amazon. A French company, Thomson CSF, was exposed by the U.S. mainstream media in tandem with the U.S. intelligence community in offering bribes to the Brazilian government, giving its competitor, U.S.-based Raytheon, an advantage with the contract bid. Of course, the contract went to Raytheon and President Bill Clinton was thanked by the intelligence community. Again, we see the three-part process, technologies advance, experiments used in imperialist wars overseas, then brought back and incorporated into the state apparatus to be used on everyone. This was all part of the second computerized information regime. Now, after 9-11, the U.S.-led wars in Iraq and Afghanistan led the precedent for a new stage in the surveillance state apparatus, the third robotic information regime. With two major interventions raging in Iraq and Afghanistan, Washington accelerated its development of electronic surveillance, biometric identification, and unmanned aerial vehicles. These new technologies and methods are now creating a new third robotic information regime. Some have even argued that a fourth branch of government has been created, the intelligence branch. Drones, satellites, and biometric identification technologies were developed and used on the people of Iraq and Afghanistan, but done within a faster process due to the development of technology, more surveillance was brought into the U.S. state apparatus. Through this warfighting domain, a huge development for the intelligence community has been signals intelligence, specifically in satellite data collection. The U.S. military has described space-based intelligence collections as a, quote, 
key force multiplier for future military operations. As they say, the objective is to deliver, quote, precise military firepower anywhere in the world, day or night, in all weather. Today, intelligence collection is the foundation of war planning. Satellites and other equipment in orbit, used by the U.S. military and intelligence agencies, have given the surveillance industry a huge advantage for not only their enemies, but for everyone on this planet. Remember, when the Pentagon talks about technological advances to be used on the so-called enemy, you better bet your ass that the state will be using it on the people back home and anyone they wish on this planet. So let's talk about the development of this third robotic information regime. Operation Stellar Wing, launched by the NSA to collect bulk telephone and internet metadata without any warrants, began in the early 2000s. In 2002, Congress erased the legal barrier which prevented the CIA to spy domestically, granting the agency access to U.S. financial records, all electronic communications, aimed mostly at political organizations, but also private citizens and even religious groups. In 2004, the FBI's investigative data warehouse was launched with a goal of storing all of their collected data. They themselves actually describe it as, quote, the single largest repository of operational and intelligence information. The IDW is a centralized, web-enabled, closed-system archive for information collection. FBI agents have described it as a one-stop shop, an uber-Google per se. Within one year, this warehouse accumulated over half a billion documents, including intelligence reports, social security files, driver's licenses, private financial information, and much, much more. All of this was accessible to 13,000 analysts. In the last year of the George W. Bush's presidency, a new program was launched but wasn't exposed until Snowden's documents became public in 2013. This program eventually became the number one source for raw intelligence used by the NSA. Today, it accounts for 91% of the agency's internet traffic acquired. The program's codename, PRISM. PRISM worked and still does with nine internet service providers to transfer billions of emails to its massive data farms, and it cooperates with as many as 100 trusted U.S. companies to share all this data with. In 2008, Keith Alexander, a former NSA director, while working at Menwith Hill, a U.S. military base in the United Kingdom, and he posed the question, quote, why can't we collect it all? All the signals, all the time. Sounds like a good summer homework project for men with. Christian Sorensen, author of Understanding the War Industry, describes the problem with any attempt to collect all data everywhere, all the time. NSA's implicit mission to collect it all? This mission generates too much information, flooding the system and overwhelming the analysts, linguists, and technicians on the receiving end in Fort Meade, Fort Gordon, Lackland Air Force Base, Hawaii Cryptologic Center, and facilities around the world. The collect-it-all approach is ineffective. It doesn't even stop the handful of people who rarely attempt to attack U.S. citizens. Collect-it-all is nonetheless promoted for two reasons. One, the flood of information allows the war industry to develop, market, and sell very expensive information technology, included but not limited to software and hardware that aggregate or merge information, allegedly simplifying the big picture. And two, collecting it all requires more broadly the expansion of the surveillance state. Additional technology, contractors, maintenance and repair, upgrades, and facilities. The corporations that have captured the War Department know a good thing when they have it. They'll never willingly surrender the self-licking ice cream cone. I'd also add a third point to Sorensen's analysis. The ruling class uses intelligence as a weapon in class warfare. Although Sorensen's claims that the collect-it-all approach is ineffective in preventing attacks on U.S. civilians, I'd argue the ruling capitalist class doesn't really care about this aspect, only insofar as to make sure a working class is always present to sell their labor to the capitalists. The collect-it-all approach does flood the system, 
but much of it is used as a weapon against the working class in order to protect the capitalist interests. Capital over labor. Later, in 2009, the Pentagon set up the U.S. Cyber Command, one of the 11 combatant commands. Its first commander, Keith Alexander. Under his leadership, he declared cyberspace an operational domain for both offensive and defensive warfare. Now, everything that has been mentioned thus far occurred before Edward Snowden leaked a massive collection of documents exposing the global surveillance order. Snowden did provide us more details, more programs, and more operations conducted by the surveillance state. But to give an idea of the intelligence community and what they were collecting in 2013, when Snowden leaked these documents, McCoy provides some insight. As of April 2013, the NSA had 117,675 active surveillance targets at home. A figure that represents many, if not most, of those providing active leadership in American political life. Think about it. If the NSA were to monitor the entire U.S. cabinet and Congress as well as the governors and all 7,382 legislators in the 50 states, we would still have to account for another 109,782 targets. Even if we were to add an average of five students and faculty at every one of the 7,398 college campuses in America, we would still have 72,792 targets to go. Throw in the editor and four reporters at each of the country's 1,395 daily newspapers and you would still have another 65,817 targets to account for. In sum, that number, 117,675, is a reasonable approximation of almost every politically active leader in America. Continuing on with this development, during the first Obama administration, the NSA expanded its network by building listening posts around the country. In 2012, a complex in Savannah, Georgia was built that cost $286 million to focus on the greater Middle East. In 2013, it retrofitted a Sony chip facility in San Antonio, Texas to focus on Latin America, and it cost $300 million. A complex in Hawaii was built that cost $358 million to focus on Asia and the Pacific. The already existing U.S. spy base in Menwith Hill added supercomputers which could process 2 million intercepts an hour. In 2013, the NSA built a data warehouse to store all of this information in Bluffdale, Utah, employing 11,000 workers, and it costs $1.6 billion. All of this was under the first administration of Obama, a man who promised us hope. In 2016, the National Reconnaissance Office, considered to be one of the big five agencies of the intelligence community, launched its seventh super-secret Advanced Orion satellite into space, the world's largest, equipped with a mesh antenna bigger than a football field, with the goal of eavesdropping from a geostationary orbit. Within the past decade, and really since the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, the biometric identification industry has exploded. After being tested on mainly civilians in Iraq and Afghanistan, where millions of people's fingerprints, iris scans, and facial photographs were collected. This technology is now being used by police departments across the United States. In 2014, BI2 Technologies began marketing a mobile app that allows police to use their phones to take photos of suspects, which uses facial recognition software, to compare the photo to a database of other photos. The Biometric Optical Surveillance System, or BOSS, was developed by and incorporated into the Department of Homeland Security. The New York Times had this to say, in a sign of how the use of such technologies can be developed for one use but then expanded to another, the BOSS research began as an effort to help the military detect potential suicide bombers and other terrorists overseas at outdoor polling places in Afghanistan and Iraq, among other sites. But in 2010, the effort was transferred to the Department of Homeland Security to be developed for use instead by the police in the United States. 
By 2016, nearly half of the U.S. population had their photos in a facial recognition network accessible to police departments under this BOSS system. And this marks the three-part process. Technologies advanced, experiments used in U.S. imperialist wars overseas, then brought back and incorporated into the state apparatus to be used on anyone and everyone. Intelligence is clearly an integral part of U.S. imperialism to both perpetuate its global power as well as repress any dissent within. The intelligence branch of the 21st century is marked by the development of what McCoy calls the Pentagon's triple canopy of pervasive surveillance systems. It's a fusion of aerospace, cyberspace, and artificial intelligence completing a new regime of robotic warfare specifically class warfare. In the end, these three information regimes provide us a framework for understanding the historical development of modern surveillance imperialism. It begins with tests and experiments overseas, technologies become refined and used on the people at home and everywhere else. If you want to learn more, I highly suggest reading Alfred McCoy's book, In the Shadows of the American Century. Much of the information in this video is based on McCoy's research. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching the Peace Report. I'll be getting busy on the weekends. I'll be getting busy on the weekdays. Listening to people see what they think. And combine that with what we say. Cause I want them to play what we sing. And then sing what they want to relay. Cause I be sipping coffee in the morning. Cause revolution ain't no fucking tea party.